Welcome to Make It a Murderer Rubber Ducky Video Channel. Thank you so much for joining me this evening for a special presentation by Dr. Silkman. It's entitled Making a Chemist the FBI and the EDTA blood swab test results from the Stephen Avery trial. Welcome everybody to today's presentation. My name's Dr. Silkman and today we need to put on our laboratory coats because the topic of today's presentation is entitled the following. Making a chemist, the FBI and the EDTA blood swab test results from the Stephen Avery trial which took place in 2007. And today I like to discuss the following topics. I like to have a look at analysis of the FBI's EDTA testing of the three supplied blood swabs from Teresa Horbach's Toyota RAV4. And finally, I like to ask the question, were there any experimental issues with the FBI's EDTA test results? Okay, the first thing we need to do is to actually ask what is EDTA? Well, EDTA is ethylene diamine tetracetic acid. It is a synthetic chemical and it's used for both industrial and medical purposes. It's been around for a very long period of time. Now EDTA is used as an anticoagulant and we find EDTA in purple top or lavender uh, blood vol tubes. And the way, and you can see that here, and the way EDTA works is that EDTA chelates or sequesters calcium ions that are present in the blood specimen. Now EDTA can also chelate other metal ions such as iron and it forms an EDTA metal complex that's known as a chelate. Now when blood is in the presence of EDTA the coagulation or the clotting process is prevented and so hence the blood remains in liquid form as we can see here. Now EDTA is not normally present in human blood cells. EDTA as a chemical is stable at room temperature in closed containers under normal storage conditions. Okay, so let's have a look at the Vacutana blood collection process in an EDTA tube. What you notice is that the Vacutana needle is double-ended. One end of the needle, of course, goes inside your vein, and the other end of the needle goes inside the tube. The blood that's collected in this process is under a vacuum seal. And we can see from the Stephen Avery blood vial that was taken in 1996, we can see a small pinprick at the top of the uh, stopper. This is completely normal. All right, now what I'm going to go through is the actual blood coagulation process or cascade in the absence and in the presence of EDTA. So if we have a look at the blood clotting cascade, we see that there are two major pathways. The intrinsic pathway, this is what happens if you damage uh, an internal blood vessel. And we have an extrinsic pathway, and this is what happens if you cut yourself on the outside. Both of these pathways come together in what is known as the common pathway. And what happens is you produce a stable fibrin clot. That's important so you do not bleed to death. But I want you to note that in the blood coagulation cascade, calcium ions are critical for this process to occur. 
Now, if you add EDTA, EDTA chelates the calcium ions. Therefore, you cannot form a stable fibrin clot. Therefore, you don't get the formation of a clot. It means that your blood is clot free in the presence of EDTA. And that explains why blood in a purple top vial uh, remains in the liquid form. Now, on the 14th of December in 2006, Wiegert, Garn, Buting and Bates went to the Manitowoc County Clerk of Court's office. And that's where they found a purple top vial of Stephen Avery's blood. As soon as the state found out about this, because remember, the defense was um, bringing forward the notion that Stephen Avery's blood had been planted in the RAF4. As soon as the state heard wind of this, Ken Kratz wrote up or put forward a motion, and that is the motion to exclude the blood vial evidence or to get the blood vial tested. So let's summarize the state versus the defense in the way they approach the presence of the blood in the RAV4. Now, the state went with, of course, the actively bleeding scenario, and that is the source of the blood stains that were recovered from the RAV4 was from Stephen Avery's actively bleeding right middle finger. However, the defense went with the planted blood scenario, that is, the source of the blood stains that were recovered from the RAV4 was from Stephen Avery's 1996 purple top blood vial. So, the FBI in Quantico, Virginia, was requested by the state to conduct an analytical chemical test for the presence or absence of EDTA in the cotton swabs obtained by Cherie Cohane from the RAV4. So here is the request form by the FBI requesting them uh, to conduct uh, EDTA testing of the uh, blood vial and also the swabs. And I'll read this out for you. I quote, Avery's trial is scheduled to begin on the 5th of February 2007. Special Prosecutor Camulet County District Attorney Ken Kratz has requested this examination be completed by the 9th of March 2007 to be used as rebuttal evidence. Now, clearly, that did not leave the FBI with very much time to get this test going and set up. Now, when was the previous time the FBI had tested for EDTA in blood? I don't think I have to say any words. So now, Stephen Avery, in Stephen Avery's case, he had become the second uh, suspect to have um, EDTA testing by the FBI. All right. Now, something rather curious happened. On the 31st of January 2007, Deputy Jer Jeremy Hawkins had obtained control swabs for the FBI. Now, these control swabs were taken from the RAV4. They were taken at areas close to the blood stains that were present in the RAV4. In addition uh, to the control swabs, the following three swabs were handed over to the FBI. And you can see the property tag numbers as well as where they had come from in the RAV4. Now, note, the original swabs were done by Cherie Cohane. Now, Dr. LeBeau was asked about the blood and control swabs. Dr. LeBeau uh, is from the FBI. I quote, question, and could you tell the court what it was that was sent to you? Answer, 
We received a number of different items. They were swabs collected from a vehicle, a RAV, Toyota RAV4, as well as control swabs and a tube of blood from Stephen Avery. So what Dr. LeBeau was talking about was these three swabs. These were originally done by Cherie Cohane. And we also had duplicate control swabs as well. They were handed over to the FBI. And finally, the FBI was also handed over the original blood vial from Stephen Avery in 1996. Now I want you to take note that that blood sample was already 11 years old when it was tested by the FBI. Okay, so let's have a look at the blood and control swabs. As you can see, we have an evidence check-in sheet where the FBI recorded all the entries or all the samples that they had received. And they labeled the swabs Q46, Q47, Q48, and the blood sample was labeled Q49. They also labeled the control swabs as well, K2, K3, K4. And note, all the control swabs were done as duplicates. Now, Dr. LeBeau was asked what he had analyzed or his analysis had analyzed. And I quote, answer, well, the analysis, Your Honor, is simply that we focused our instrument to look for two of the two of the products that are on the screen. We look specifically for the presence of EDTA that was bound to the iron in the blood and we chose iron over calcium because it is naturally present at about 10 to 30 times higher amount than is calcium. And then we also look for the presence of the free acid form of the actual EDTA. Again, that is because there's so much there in an EDTA tube. That's what you should expect to see the most of, unless it's a case of like a poisoning or something, a metal poisoning. So this is what Dr. LeBeau was referring to. So this is blood in the presence of EDTA. And what Dr. LeBeau mentioned was there are three products you expect to see in that blood sample. EDTA and calcium chelate. Now note, the FBI did not test for this. You also have EDTA iron chelate. And the reason why they tested for this because it's at a much higher level or concentration than the EDTA calcium chelate. And finally, free, the free acid form of EDTA. Dr. LeBeau was asked, did they develop a scientific hypothesis? And remember, we have two opposing theories, the defenses and the state's theory. I quote, did you develop a scientific hypothesis for this case before you did your testing? Answer. Well, we did, yes. Question, and what was that? Answer, again, if I can go to this presentation, the idea was what we were asked to do is determine if someone took a purple stopper tube of blood that has EDTA in it, takes the cap off that tube, and then pours a drop, or many drops out, onto the surface, if someone comes along at a later date, swabs up that dried blood stain, are we able to then find on that swab from that stain the presence of EDTA and EDTA linked with iron? So one can clearly see here that if you've got a purple top tube of blood, you're going to expect to find both EDTA and EDTA chelated to iron. If it's blood from uh, an actively bleeding finger, then you don't expect either EDTA or EDTA iron chelate to be detected in that sample. 
All right. Now, as every good scientist know, knows, it's very important for experimental controls. And of course, Dr. LeBeau had discussed the controls that they used uh, in the experiments. And that you can actually see a summary of these in Troll Exhibit 434. And they used the following controls. They used a working internal standard solution, which was essentially the free acid form of EDTA dissolved in water. They also used a negative blood stain control, and that was derived from whole blood that was not from an EDTA tube. They used a positive blood stain control, which was whole blood from an EDTA tube. And they used another positive control. In actual fact, it was a test. And that was the whole blood from Stephen Avery's 1996 blood vial. And as you can see here, here is the original blood vial. And remember what I stated previously? This blood already was 11 years old. And what is curious, the FBI actually wrote down the stability of the solutions and blood samples that they used in their experiment. So the working internal standard solution they stated was stable for at least six months. But note the following. The, both their negative and positive blood stain controls, they guaranteed a stability for at least two years. But remember, the blood that they were testing from the vial was already 11 years old by the time they got to test it. Okay, so let's have a look at the experimental procedure or protocol that the FBI used for the trial. They started off with a dried blood stain from a cotton swab. Now they had samples with EDTA or with no EDTA and remember they were from a cotton swab. Now you've got to realize that blood itself contains a very complex mixture of molecules, some very large, some very small. So what they did was they extracted the blood using deionized water. They then took that and, they, in a, in, and it underwent a process called ultrafiltration. The purpose of doing that is so that you end up with a much less complex mixture of molecules. And that's important. They then took the filtrate and they used a machine known as liquid chromatography, mass spectrometry, mass spectrometry. And they used a variety of settings uh, in their uh, setup. And you can see the machinery here. So this is a cartoon representation of the machinery that they used. And as you can see, it is very, very complex. But what the FBI were looking for was the presence of EDTA iron chelate, EDTA in the free acid form, and you've got to remember each of these molecules has a specific both size and charge. It has a diagnostic molecular fingerprint. So by using all the appropriate control solutions, they can read from their uh, charts, their computer charts, exactly what is present in those dried blood stains. So the experimental setup appeared to be quite robust and sound. Okay, so what were the final results obtained? Now you can go to the original reference if you like. Uh, the document is close to 700 pages in length and I went through the entire document to have a look at what results they got. Now Dr. LeBeau was asked, okay, what results did you finally get? I quote, based upon your test results using the LCMS MS technique and based upon all of the data 
and comp and compilations that you reviewed and basically the entire case file that you have do you have an opinion to a reasonable degree of scientific certainty whether the blood stains from Teresa Horbuck's RAV4 that you tested came from the vial of blood from Stephen Avery which was in the Manitowoc County Clerk of Kurt's, uh, Court's office? Answer. I do have an opinion on it. Question. And what is that opinion? Answer. My opinion is that the blood stains did not come from that tube of blood. So in essence, let's review this. He found, or his analysis found, no EDTA or EDTA iron chelate from Q46, Q47, Q48. But they did find EDTA and EDTA iron chelate in Q49, which was Stephen Avery's EDTA 1990-96 blood vial. Okay, now let's have a look at trial exhibit 435 in which they wrote, the FBI wrote, some remarks about the tests that they had conducted. Now, if you look at a normal blood collection vial that's got EDTA in it, the concentration of EDTA in that blood vial tube ranges between a thousand to 2,000 milligrams per liter. The FBI procedure that they use can detect DNA at a concentration of around 13 milligrams per liter. So hence one would expect that if the EDTA was present in that blood sample they would be able to detect it. They also showed that EDTA was able to be detected in a one microliter drop of EDTA preserved blood. All right, now Janine Avazu, um, for the defense, uh, went through the entire documentation of the FBI. So she was basically giving a rebuttal to the experimental protocol that was used by the FBI and I quote question could you talk about that for a moment what you think about that answer yeah he essentially says that when I get results when I get results from the laboratory it either shows that EDTA is detected or not detected those are the only two options I agree that those are the only two options that can come out of his protocol. It's either detected or it's not. But then he draws the conclusion that in the event that it's not detected, which is the case here, in these stain samples, in the event that EDTA is not detected in the stain samples, he draws the conclusion that that means it must have come from active bleeding rather than from Mr. Avery's tube. That's just simply not supported by the actual laboratory results in this case. Question, and why not? Is there some other conclusion? Answer, yes. It certainly is quite plausible that the blood stains that were swabbed from the RAV4 contained EDTA but the lab simply was not able to detect it, as was the case in that two microliter sample of Mr. Avery's blood that they attempted to test and were not able to detect EDTA. Well, this now brings up the question, and an important question, were the FBI EDTA blood swab test results in actual fact reliable? So, let me summarize the FBI EDTA testing results and also pose a few questions. The state had requested the FBI to test blood cotton swabs 
that were obtained from Teresa Horbuck's Toyota RAV4 for the presence or absence of the anticoagulant EDTA. Three of the six original blood cotton swabs, these were done by Cherie Cohane from Teresa Horbuck's Toyota RAV4, were supplied to the FBI. Now, what concerns me is that there is a lack of crime scene documentation by Cohane for these original blood cotton swabs that were taken from the Toyota RAV4. And this is really unforgivable. The FBI did not re-swab the Toyota RAV4 with fresh de novo blood swabs. Now this leads to major, or it is a major experimental oversight. It now introduces a planting possibility. The control swabs, which were done in duplicates from the Toyota RAV4, they were freshly done by Deputy Hawkins for the FBI. Now, the FBI did use appropriate experimental controls. They used negative, positive, and an internal control for their EDTA testing procedure. So it appeared to be quite robust from a scientific viewpoint. The FBI had used a LCMS MS instrument in order to detect both free EDTA and EDTA iron chelate from the dried blood spot samples. Now, the actual instrument setup that the FBI used was able to detect EDTA at a concentration of around 13 milligrams per liter, knowing that the normal levels of EDTA in a blood vial is around 1,000 to 2,000 milligrams per liter. So therefore, their setup should have been able to detect EDTA as low as 30 milligrams per liter. However, there's an issue. The FBI experimental setup, it would not be able to detect EDTA at concentrations lower than 30, 13 milligrams per liter. So remember the rebuttal so hence EDTA may still be present in the blood swab samples but they are actually below the detection limit so this is an important experimental limitation now no EDTA or EDTA iron chelate was detected in any of the three blood swab samples, that is Q46, Q47 and Q48 that were derived from the Toyota RAV4. Now EDTA and EDTA iron chelate was detected in Q49, that's the blood vial, but the FBI did not report what the levels were when they detected it. They had left that out. So here's the major problem. Are the FBI test results in fact reliable? And the other concern of course is, did the judge and the jury actually understand the testimonies of LeBeau and Avizu? Now I went through both testimonies, all of them, and they were very difficult to follow because they were quite complex. A lot of experimental terms and techniques were discussed. Now as a scientist, yes I could understand what they were talking about, but one has to wonder what, whether the judge or the jury actually understood the implications of these findings. Alright, but there are other concerns with the testing results. And as I've stated to you previously, the blood that the FBI had tested was already 11 years old. So no one 
including Dr. LeBeau, actually knew how stable the EDTA or the EDTA chelate would be in such a sample that was 11 years old. And it begs the question, did the EDTA degrade to a point below the FBI's experimental detection limit of 13 milligrams per liter? That is indeed possible. But here's the other major, major issue. And Dr. LeBeau was questioned about this. Question. So when Mr. Brewer was doing the tests, when he was putting, you know, running a test to see if there was EDTA in item Q46, he knew that item Q46 was a swab from the vehicle? Answer. Yes, he did. Now, what's the problem there? Well, the FBI analysts knew the origins of the swabs. So he knew which ones were test samples, which ones were controls, and where they had come from. So essentially, it was not a blind study. And you can see from the expression of this scientist, that's a rookie mistake. It's important that when you're testing something, especially in a case like this, the person testing the samples should not know already where the samples had come from. So that's a major issue with the experiment that was done by the FBI. Now, I like you to leave you, I want to leave you with this. Was it actually possible to fool the FBI? Now, Ken Kratz was no dummy. He understood the power of the planting scenario, planting the blood in the RAV4. So this is one of the things that he had said during the trial. And it's basically trying to counteract the possibility that planting had taken place in the RAV4. And I quote, This isn't just two guys. It's Jim Lenk and it's Andy Colburn. And when you accuse police officers of official misconduct, that's serious business. Mr. Strang correctly predicted that there would be some anger about this issue coming from the prosecution side. And there is. Let me tell you why. Their, now note the following. Their livelihood their reputations, their families, everything in their 20 plus years of law enforcement are on the line when some lawyer accuses them of misconduct. Not just any misconduct, but planting evidence in a murder case. All right? Which was very, which was very interesting because remember, Stephen Avery's reputation, Brendan Dassey's reputation, and also of their families, were also on the line. Of course, someone like Ken Kratz had no care for either Brendan nor Stephen. So here's the question. How could a blood planting scenario take place without any suspicion at all? And I'll leave you with this. Was it just a simple shell game? Now, I want to leave you with this point. In my next presentation, I'm going to go through a speculative scenario in which it was actually very, very easy to fool the FBI. Okay, that's the end of my presentation. Thank you for listening, guys. Uh, in this presentation, I'd use the following uh, original documents, which you're more than welcome to uh, check out. And please, do not hesitate to ask me questions. You can put them down in the comment section, and I'll answer them as soon as I can. And I want to thank you all for all your kind comments and support. And as usual, I'd like to thank Rubber Ducky and all her fellow duckies for constant discussions, constant information, and 
fantastic discourse uh, over oh, close to half a year. And I want to leave you with this. How important that molecule is of EDTA to Stephen Avery's trial. Thank you very much. I appreciate it. Oh,